Hello everyone. Welcome to this session on critical and cultural theories and media society theories. I first take this opportunity to welcome all the students of PGJMC and MAJMC of School of Journalism and New Media Studies IGNU. And we also very well know that a lot of other people are also watching this program and these programs are being liked by them. Accordingly, we are trying to make our programs as simple to understand and as comprehensive as can possibly be. This session is a follow-up from the previous session where we started with what the various theories are. We dealt with sociological and psychological theories besides the models of communication and the concepts of communication. So here we talk today about critical and cultural theories and we talk about media society theories. In this session, under the critical and cultural theories, we would discuss four theories. We would discuss the Marxist theories. We would discuss the critical theories, the cultural theories, and the political economy theory. Besides that, in media society theories, we will talk about technological determinism, media and public sphere, audience theories, and feminist media theories. So, before we begin, let us try and recapitulate what we understand by mass communication theory. According to Barron, mass communication theories are explanations and predictions of social processes that draw a relationship between media messages and the personal, social and cultural systems of a society. We all know that media does not exist in isolation. It is a subsystem of the social context, the cultural context and the political milieu of any society. So these theories try to understand, they help you understand the media messages in social, cultural and personal context such that you are not confused with the various media messages that you come across and you know how to make the right choice. Precisely, this is the relevance of media theories. And why study theories? Because you are bombarded by media messages day in and day out, right from the beginning of the day, like through the newspaper ads, the TV commercials, the radio jingles, hoardings, announcements, etc. So how do you know whether to believe the information that you get or to ignore it? Media dictates our choices in various ways. They bring about subtle changes in our behavior by affecting our mindset and influencing our choices. They influence us within our personal ambit, the cultural ambit and the social ambit. So it is necessary to understand all the phenomena that go around with media so as to make the right decision at the right time. Now we start with the Marxist theories. Karl Marx was a great thinker and he gave us the concept of Borzu and the proletariat. The Borzu during those times were the people who were more influential, the capitalists who had the money to set up industries. And proletariat was the working class, people who worked for wages, people who had put in their effort and hard work and used to draw minimal wages for it. So similarly, when we talked about Marxist theories in context of communication, we are talking in terms of media owners and media audiences. When we talk in terms of media owners, these are the media elite people, people who try and formulate an opinion of the audience. And the media audiences eagerly take up these media messages. The content of media is consumed, is absorbed by the media audiences and then they set up an, um, a particular opinion on a certain subject. Media messages form a common culture. We all know that since we are talking about mass media per se, also technology oriented media these days, these media messages are helping us form a common culture. They help us homogenize more. Because since they are able to influence your opinions and dictate your choices, they are able to tell you what is better or what stands a greater chance of acceptance amongst the audience than the others. By this, they are able to homogenize the choices. We all know about Stuart Hall. Stuart Hall was a thinker of the Birmingham School of Thought and he said that media appears to reflect 
the reality while they are constructing it. Even in my last lecture, I had emphasized upon the point that uh, reality is not what is real. Reality is what is perceived. And this perception, the perceptual dimension comes to us through the media. So it appears to reflect the reality as we all know. It covers t things, it covers uh, events and brings it to light. But there is a certain reconstruction attached to it, which is because of the subjectivity which automatically comes in whenever we are talking of a reporter covering it or an editor editing it or a news editor taking a decision about whether or not the story should go into the media. So the production is the process of cultural production. So what are they trying to produce? What is it that they're trying to construct and reconstruct? Those are all cultural processes. And Stuart Hall called it encoding and decoding. So there are various media messages, various events that are taking place, which are being encoded in a certain way by media. You would see various media channels would uh, project the same event in a different manner. While some may project it positively, others may take a negative note of it. So there is some encoding of message taking place here and it gets decoded at the audience's end. And values and assumptions are inscribed in texts. We all follow a certain value system. We all have backgrounds, beliefs, values, norms that we adhere to. These values and these assumptions of values are inscribed in the texts. By text, I mean photographs, a film, a documentary, a feature, an analysis, anything. So any sort of content, whatever be its form and structure, when it is presented to the audience, we call it media text. So these values and assumptions are inscribed in those media texts and they are translated from them by the audiences. Media hence becomes a field of ideological struggle. Like say for example, when we talk about the Corona times, these times, we say that there are a number of government policies which are better in other countries as compared to India, be it health related policies or be it economics related, anything for that matter. So there is a certain ideology, a certain school of thought, a certain opinion that is working behind it, what makes us think differently from others. So media provides a very uh, vibrant field of ideological struggle of people. Now there are three kinds of readings of this text from the point of view of the audience. I just said all sorts of media content for you is text. So now when we're talking about texts, there are three kinds of readings that audiences do per se. One is the dominant reading. The dominant reading is when you're completely convinced by the content that has been provided to you by the media. It could be a book chapter, it could be a blog, it could be something on social media that you've seen and reacted to, it could be a TV program, radio, newspaper, anything. So when we talk about dominant reading, say for example, all of us who agree with the policies of uh, the government, the latest policy is that they are ready to sell liquor and all the liquor shops in, the, uh, in various places will be open. This is to support the economy as they say. So everybody who totally agrees with this concept, we will call it dominant reader. So this kind of a person is convinced with what is being provided in the form of content from the media. Then we come to oppositional reading. There will be a large number of people who would believe that due to a large liquor intake, since everybody is supposed to be inside their homes, there is a lot of liquor intake. It will also uh, lead to wife beating and uh, you know violence in the domestic violence and things like that. So hence, these are the people who will oppose the sale of liquor um, in the country. So also is negotiated reading, people who take the middle path, people who appreciate that the government is trying to make an effort to bring back the economy in a certain way. And at the same time, they also understand that uh, 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 the cases of domestic violence might rise due to sale of liquor. So these are the various kind of text readings. When you come across an information, when you come across a content, how do you react to it as an audience? The next we come to critical theories. 
Now, uh, Marxist theories were in themselves critical of the social structure because they believed that the entire procedure of how the profit is dissipated in the society is not very correct. It does not suit the large majority of people, which is the proletariat. So critical theories arose out of Marxist theories. And they did not just study the phenomena that existed, the way media behaved. They were also criticizing what was happening. So they attempted to critique and change the society rather than just understanding it or observing it or exploring it. It discusses the critical theory, it discusses the source, the analysis of the texts of intended meaning and the implica implications of representation and misrepresentation. What we mean by this is, when you discuss the source of a certain information, who is the uh, creator of this information or creator of the content and then you analyze the text what is being given to the audience from various perspectives? This also includes reading between the lines. This also uh, includes background information and knowledge of certain things. So all this comes under analysis of the media text. And the intended meaning, what is it which they are actually trying to convey through this content? And the implications of representation or misrepresentation. Once you come across a certain content, media content, and you're engaging with that media content, either they are completely, if it is a very effective piece of communication and it is able to uh, completely, um, you know, put across the intended meaning, then you would call it a certain representation which it is trying to give. But if you misunderstand that communication, it may result into misrepresentation. So there are implications of both representation of media messages as well as misrepresentation of media messages. So how do you justify the ideology that you're propagating is important to understand. So critical theories delve into who the source is, what is the kind of content, the media text that is being given to the audience to engage themselves in. And then what is the representation or misrepresentation of an idea or uh, a certain section of the population, say women, children, youth, anyone? And how do they justify the ideology being propagated? How do they justify a certain kind of ideology which they are propagating through the media content? All these areas are areas of research for critical theorists. Okay, Gramsci, Antonio Gramsci gave this concept of hegemony. Hegemony means the dominance of a certain social class over other. We have seen traditionally how uh, class system existed in the country, how caste system existed in the country. In current times, we still talk about racism, we talk about gender disparity. So there is a certain hegemony that definitely exists in any social structure, whereby the more powerful section of the society always dominates on the others. And this concept is called hegemony, which was given by Antonio Gramsci. This again is studied under the critical theories. Then we come to cultural studies. To begin with, what is culture? Culture is the um, sum total, a cumulative sum of experiences of a society. So when we say, when we talk about Indian tradition and Indian culture, it has come to us through the ages. Things that we have found to be true or succeeding, successfully uh, implementing in certain kind of social setups, in certain kind of scenarios. And this is called culture, which we build together, which we pass on from generations to generations. It keeps changing, but more or less the larger concerns remain fixed. Now, under the cultural studies, we talk about media production as a process of cultural production. Like I just said in the beginning of my lecture that media does not exist in isolation. Media is a subsystem of three dominant systems, the society, the economy and the polity. Now here, when we talk about cultural production, media produces culture, media creates values. And everything is done so subtly, so subconsciously, what you subconsciously take in and accept, this wider acceptance will result into the formation of culture. 
Culture is again dynamic, not fixed. It keeps changing from time to time, but the, the changes in culture are so minuscule and unobservable that you would not notice it up front. Then it makes meaning of media text in the light of its cultural context. The content that, you, that, that has been given to you, you as the audiences, to engage with, it makes meaning of that media text. And in the light of this, there is a certain cultural context that gets created. Now here there are two things. Media messages emanate from cultural contexts and social contexts only. They cannot uh, portray a picture devoid of the social and cultural context. At the same time, it, when it creates meaning, this media text starts getting seen in fresh light of the cultural context and the social context. So this is how, you know, the rise of the phoenix, as we say. So this is how culture keeps changing and social values keep changing. They emanate, they get into this machinery called media, content gets generated, regurgitated, it reaches the audience, audience accepts or rejects it, and then it becomes again a part of the existing culture and society. So the cycle goes on. And it tries to analyze culture. These cultural studies that we're talking about, they analyze culture, its formulation, and how it is positioned in the society. So say, for example, we talk of um, a certain section of the society, say the queer, or say the women. How are they positioned in the society? Are they seen as the lesser halves? Or like the Nordic countries, are they given complete right and freedom, which is totally 100% equal to the male counterparts? How is it that the entire society sees them? So you analyze the existing culture, you look at its formulation, what has gone into the making of such cultural values, such social values, and then how it is being positioned in the society, how it is being sold, culture has to be sold. Culture is created by media, not because it has to be uh, put in museums, but because it has to be sold to the audience. And once it is sold, it is also accepted. Then it evaluates the social practices and looks at political motives. When we talk of creating culture, we are trying to either imply that we are creating new cultural values or we are reinforcing the existing ones. Both the cases, there is some larger goal which is involved here. It could be the evaluation of a social practice, whether what we are doing is good or bad and should it be changed in the, in the larger good. And it has certain political motives as well. So you try to push certain sections of the society because you think you can gain mileage after, out of them. Then it sees consumption of culture as an active process. Since the people are active, since the audiences that we are talking about are active. So it is also to be seen as consumption of cultural, uh, uh, cultural norms and values as an active process. It is not a passive thing. Unlike the media theories of, uh, say, 100 years back when they talked about uh, the audience being passive, we'll discuss it later, that the audiences are passive and media can do whatever it wants to do with it. That is not the case anymore. In fact, we're around the corner where media has almost become inert. So consumption of culture has become a very active process because the people who are involved in participation, creation, acceptance, rejection of these cultural values are active. Now, now we come to the political economy theory. This theory studies the social relationships and power relationships. Now, social relationships of what and power relationships of what? The factors that are involved in this relationship, whose relationship we are trying to study, are the mass media systems themselves, the producers of the content, the distributors of the content, the consumers of the content. So there is a certain power relationship that exists between these four factors. Media and the way this potent tool called media is being used by content creators, content editors, and the way it is being sent out to the consumers. Whether or not consumers are verifying it, accepting it, rejecting it, those people who are involved in the distribution. We all know newspapers these days come late. They come late by 24 hours. The same you get RSS feeds on your Facebook and every few minutes there are so many different apps that are there in your mobile phones these days which will provide you 
uh, every development of every minute. So the speed with which the distribution of this content takes place because whatever reaches first will obviously have that first mover advantage where an audience is able to grasp and understand things better rather than when the, when the same news starts coming repeatedly. So there are these four factors whose relationship and power equation is studied when we talk about the political economy theory. It also studies the role of state and technological developments because when we, when we talk about political economy, we are talking at large of the society vis-a-vis -vis the polity and polity vis-a-vis -vis the economy. Economics today is involved everywhere, be it technology, be it poverty, be it politics, be it society, you name it and it has a certain economic aspect to it. So we cannot do away with the economy and because economics or money is involved in every uh, transaction of the society, politics comes in between. Hence this is called the political economy theory. The focus areas of the political economy theory um, in which the researchers uh, research are media ownership. We all know there has been a tussle for over 10 years now, more than a decade now that uh, media tries to have a monopoly. So the greater the monopoly of media, the less diversified is the content which we get from it. There is less plurality of the content. Uh, also this media ownership affects other businesses, especially when the media owner, the capitalist is also owning other businesses. So on the whole media becomes a potent tool in the hands of this owner, in the hands of this capitalist to use for his or her own uh, you know, interests. So the focus area is media ownership and how ownership and conglomeration of media affects various other fields. The second is the peripheral processes. Peripheral processes could be events being held or advertisements coming out or marketing communications taking place. So these are, these are not central to media. Nevertheless, these are marketing related communications which are being sent out to the audiences in order to create the preferred choices as preferred by the source. So if I want you to buy certain X product or a Y service, uh, my communication would be designed to impress upon you the fact that this is the best product better than the others in the market, better than the competition. So these are the peripheral processes. Then we also have government policies in them. We all know there is a lot of, uh, you know, uh, how easy you make it for content to reach people, how the ease of business. The ease of business is one thing, the policy formulation such that it governs what you can and what you cannot beyond a certain, um, certain say a fraction of shares you cannot buy in other businesses as a media owner. All those are government policies which also have a large bearing because they on a large scale they are able to affect the way media works. So a study of all these focus areas comprises the political economy theory. Now we come to technological determinism. With this we begin with the media society theories. The technological determinism largely talks about how technology is able to determine the changes of various kinds, of various kinds, you know, uh, that people come across. It could be social changes, it could be cultural changes, it could be interpersonal exchanges. We know in these times of Corona when everybody is uh, staying glued in their houses, the only way we can socialize is through technology. So you are trying to keep everyone, uh, you know, um, in your ambit by means of using technology. So this is an example of technological determinism. On a larger scale, this was a very minute example that I uh, gave you. But technological determinism largely speaks of something very, uh, uh, very vast and bigger than this. It talks of social change. And when I say social change, it is not something as minuscule as this. It is to bring about a change in the way the entire community, the entire society behaves. Say for example, uh, the way people felt about girl-child education was different, maybe an age back or one generation back, but today they think differently. 
Also, the norm was to have two or three children in a family. Today, they have come up to one or two, not more than that. So ideally, this is the kind of social change where people understand that you have to provide for education of all children equally and you have to have the resources for that. It also defines a society's media consumption. When you're talking of technology and how ingrained, how well ingrained it is in the fabric of the society, you obviously talk about media consumption. So as much is the media consumption, so much is technology determining social changes. Mass production is taking place, mass access is there, mass consumption is there. Say for example, this Facebook uh, session that we're having, we know this is getting across to so many people all at the same time. So there, and it'll, it'll also be available after the session is over. So mass production is taking place here at a large scale. There is mass access, many people are accessing it and there is also mass consumption. Since many people are accessing it, there is also mass consumption. Then we talk about, uh, when we talk about technological determinism, we talk about hard determinism and soft determinism. Let us see what hard determinism means. When we say hard determinism, we talk of technology as being an independent and forceful thing. Uh, as far as social change is concerned. So it is independent of what it is, independent of social concerns. It does not care. Technology has um, outgrown humans. So it has become so potent, it has become so important that it does not care, it does, does not have any social concerns. And humans have less choice. So human beings have become weak. You would have all seen all those uh, sci-fi movies where they talk about artificial intelligence and they talk about machines trying to overcome the humans. So that is one um, wild example, I would say, of hard determinism. Also, there is soft determinism. People who believe in um, technological determinism as a soft process believe that this is an important um, uh, important force which has, which is a guiding force in fact, which has guided the human evolution at large. But it is not the only factor. There are other social factors, cultural factors and various other things. When you listen to the interviews of uh, scientists who are working in artificial intelligence, they would say that yes, machines can only become equal to humans, they cannot supersede humans. Why? Because it is the human being who's making technology. It is the human being who's making these machines. So they may be robots, but the robots would have only as much intelligence as the creator of that robot has. Cannot grow multitude. So, now we come to the next, media and the public sphere. Public sphere has for a long, long time been associated with Habermas, the German social scientist who is popular for this theory of public sphere. There are a few postulates that um, have been very simply put here and that, uh, that will easily explain what this media and uh, public sphere means. Public sphere basically is a space. Now what kind of a space is it? These are the characteristics of the space. One, it is open to all citizens. So everybody can participate. Everybody can uh, grab a bit of that space. The participants do not represent any political or business interests. So there is no political slant. There is no uh, affiliations to certain political parties or certain businesses. They are neutral, all these participants in the public sphere. There is no hierarchy. There is no high and low. There is no deciding the fact that who is, you know, uh, who sits first and who sits second. So there is no hierarchy. Then there is, what are they here to discuss? They are here to discuss social issues, cultural issues. Anything which is of larger interest and larger good is open for discussion in public sphere. Then there is a formulation of public opinion. When you discuss what happens, a certain public opinion emerges out of it, a certain way, a certain, uh, you know, thought emerges out of the, that discussion. And the citizen involvement, this uh, resultant discussion, the resultant public opinion is helping citizens getting involved in policy making. So policy making no more remains the fora of the government and the government officials and the bureaucrats itself. 
It is also important to understand how important a space you are a part of and how constructive discussions are helping in either formulating or aiding the formulation of the policies, the government policies. So this is public sphere. And we talk of, uh, you know, what can go into the public sphere, what cannot go into the public sphere, what is it that we would call classified information? Is information really classified today? We all know data is getting sold. We all know there are business interests involved. So there is no, pub, uh, you know, uh, classified information. There is all public sphere. But how valid, you know, are the discussions will decide how important that public sphere is. Now we come to the audience theories. Audience theories are the theories which explore the relationship between the audience and the media text. Now the media in itself, though it has always been, uh, you know, uh, criticized of pushing certain ideologies of uh, uh, giving across certain kind of content which may not always be for social good and for serving its own business interests. But the audience at large is a very difficult thing to deal with. Why? Because audiences by all means are heterogeneous. Even two children brought up in the same family do not think alike. So the heterogeneity of human mind is much beyond exploration. And obviously it is a, a huge challenge for any media to be able to satisfy a certain section of the population, a certain section of the audiences completely. That is precisely why we talk about audiences theories. And they are the, they are the base of this relationship which exists between the audiences and the media. When is this relationship stronger? This relationship is stronger when the audiences uh, find their media credible. When they do not have to go and say this is fake news. When they don't have to cross check and verify which has become so important in today's times because, uh, because of information overload. Because we are getting the same information from so many different sources. It is now up to us. It is the onus of the audiences to see and verify the information and then believe it. Because what you believe you act upon. Before acting upon you must verify. Anyways, talking about these audience theories, when we talk about the relationship between audiences and media texts. Media text has a certain relationship. Why? I will give you an example. There can be, a, um, there can be an article by a renowned scientist and I would like to believe it more because the data and the way it has been presented is something, uh, you know, which I would like to believe. So ideally my relationship with the media is based on the creator of the content. Now, who are these audiences? Who are these people who are interacting with the content, who are engaging with the content and then either choosing or rejecting it? How are they engaging? Are they making use of it to create their own content? We know prosumers um, are not a new phenomenon anymore. Or is it that they are engaging in order to formulate an opinion of themselves and then exercise certain media choices? What kind of messages are being given a greater preference in the arena of the audiences? What are the uh, you know, messages which are being accepted? Which are the ones which are being rejected? This relationship, the intertwining relationship is studied under the audiences theories. And this, these are a few audiences theories that uh, have been talking of the role of audiences um, in creation of the content or in interaction, the engagement of the content. The hypodermic needle theory, we all know it is a dodo theory. It, is, it does not really exist anymore until and unless you talk of the hard determinism under technological determinism. Hypodermic needle theory said that uh, people are passive, audiences are passive and media has all the influence which it wants to exercise over its audience and the in audiences are, uh, have no power at all to resist the kind of influence which media throws at it. So it is like a hypodermic needle, a doctor's needle. So it has content in it and it injects itself into the body of the audiences and the audiences are too weak, too passive to resist it. 
This theory does not apply any longer, it does not exist any longer. Nevertheless, this is an example of the audience's theories of what we study when we talk about the audiences. Probably this kind of a theory does exist in, in interpersonal relationships. Many of us have one person in life who we would not say no to. So they are almost like a hypodermic needle theory equation with us. Then you have a two-step flow and a multi-step flow of information. Now, when we were talking about the two-step and multi-step flow of information, it came after the hypodermic needle theories came. And they were talking uh, more in terms of the limiting effects of media. What is the meaning of limiting effects? That the media is not all powerful the way hypodermic needle theory stated. It is based more upon trust. It is based more upon the credibility that the source shares amongst its audiences. So the two-step flow said that information comes from opinion leaders to opinion followers. This was the first time that in communication uh, theories and communication research, we started talking about opinion leaders and opinion followers. So who were these opinion leaders? These opinion leaders were the people who had first access to any information. And they would understand it, analyze it, and then explain it to others. So say, for example, uh, somebody who's more tech savvy will obviously be the opinion leader for those who do not understand technology very well. So they will depend on the uh, opinion of this tech savvy person to help them decide which technology to choose or if they are in a fix, how to you know, solve the problem. So this is a two-step flow, flow of information from uh, the source of the source or the content to the opinion leader, this is one, from opinion leader to the opinion follower, this is two. Similarly, multi-step flow spoke largely about a lot of opinion leaders, a, a, a complicated network of opinion leaders and opinion followers. So say for example, one person can be the opinion leader on technology like we just said. Another one who is the opinion follower for this person can be an opinion leader in fashion. Someone else can be an opinion leader in investment and economics and will be an opinion follower for both technology as well as fashion. So everybody or most people who are aware of certain segments of uh, information, certain uh, kinds of information can be opinion leaders in their own right and will be opinion leaders in uh, opinion followers uh, in other areas. So this is a complicated network where every opinion leader can also be an opinion follower and every, every opinion follower will be in turn an opinion leader. So this was the two-step and multi-step flow. This is again an audience theory. Why? Because it talks about the way audiences perceive the information which is the kind of information which they give greater credibility and uh, importance to and how do they you know take information related to other sectors other fields from opinion leaders then we come to reception theory reception theory again speaks about the reception of messages by the audience the heterogeneous culture that we have been talking about in this session a number of times there is a heterogeneous culture that exists so culture, because um, the value system and the background of every individual is different from another's, so they may think differently than others. So the reception of the same message would be different for different sections of the audience. This is why I say that satisfying all sections of the society or all sections of the audiences in itself is a very difficult task. It is not a simple task which the media makes an attempt at. So when we talk about reception theory, it is about how messages are being received by the audiences and what is it that uh, you know affects the audiences more than the rest. So this is reception theory. And then of course the active audience theory, theor the theory which speaks about audiences not being passive. This is the time of user generated content whereby people create their own content, they are prosumers, they are producers of content as well as consumers of content. So this we call the UGC and this is the active audience theory. The last section of this session is on feminist media theories. 
Feminism has been the talk everywhere for a very long time now, for ages now, be it media, be it films, be it household conversations. Everywhere we talk about feminism, feminist related things, the concepts that are related to it, the inequalities that we, uh, you know, we see in our daily lives, all those things together. So this is a group of theories that explores the representations of gender and the concepts which are related to it. When we say representations of gender, in different societies, gender constructs and the way gender is represented is different from other societies. So the concepts which are created, which are related to it are created side by side. So these theories study this uh, basic aspect of gender and the various constructs then that we come across. Then it also studies the division of power. There are patriarchal societies, there are very few matriarchal societies. So the division of power and responsibility will decide upon that. So this is also under the purview of feminist media theories. Then there are various versions of feminism. Social scientists, while they have been researching on fem feminist media theories, have been talking about things like liberal feminism, radical feminism. Now, liberal feminism is when you very liberally and, uh, uh, you know, outrightly say that, yes, the women have been deprived and they have been oppressed for a long time. And the radical feminism believes that there cannot be any equality However much you try, there cannot be any equality until you change the social structures. So until you change the power balance in a patriarchal society by giving more power in terms of economies, it, it, economics or in terms of uh, uh, rights, responsibilities, power to the woman, there would not be any equity. This is the more radical side of feminism. And the third is the Marxist feminism, which talks about the means of production lied with men and because it was just like the Marxist thought propagated there was one section which was the capitalist section and the other section which was the working class the workers so means of production lied with the capitalist in this case the men which deprived the women automatically and so there was no social equity this is the Marxist look at feminism now, what are the broad areas of study under feminist media theories? They talk about the way gender is represented in media texts. So we have, like I said, media text means all sorts of media content. The way gender is represented in media content of various kinds, in films, in autobiographies, books, news analysis, news itself, hard news. So every way, the way gender is represented is studied under feminist media theories. Also the production of media texts and how do they look at it? Production of media text, how many filmmakers today in uh, Bollywood are women as compared to men? How is their work different from the men directors? So that is the production part of media text. How, do, how does a woman director, film director, looks at a woman? The sexuality, the character, and how do they define it? And then of course, now the third thing is reading of the text, which is how does the audience receive it? How does the audience engage, it, engage with it? Do they like it? Do they accept it? Do they reject it? Are they more, uh, you know, vociferous about projecting an idea or an ideology which is against what has been projected in the uh, media content or the media text? Those are the various areas of study in feminist media theories. So that's all about all the media theories and learning excites thought and I'm sure that all these theories that I have been speaking about at length today have helped you, um, you know, uh, initiate certain thoughts, certain mental patterns. Happy learning till we meet again. Bye-bye.